getting the most out of every ingredient. That's the mark of a maker. The KitchenAid Blender Collection. Welcome to the British Library Food Season event, generously sponsored by KitchenAid. My name is Polly Russell and I'm a curator at the British Library and the curator and founder of the Food Season. And this year I have had the delight of working with Angela Clutton as the guest director. As usual with the food season, we wanted to have a series of events which were eclectic, relevant, and involving some of the most interesting voices in food and history and culture, as well as an opportunity to showcase British Library collections. And tonight's event with Simon Sharma and Claudia Rodan, chaired by Lucy Silver, just could not be more perfect. Not only are the speakers fantastic, but also the event coincides and accompanies the British Library's current exhibition, Hebrew Manuscripts, Journeys of the Written Word. This includes rarely seen treasures of music, science and philosophy from some of the most famous Jewish scholars dating back to the 10th century. And I haven't visited yet because I haven't been on site, but I've been told that there's a love potion involving basil, which is food of some sort. So I'm delighted and can't wait to see that. The exhibition is open until April. And so if anyone can get to the British Library, I think it would be wonderful for you to go and visit. For this evening's event, which is about to start, please do submit questions which are available um, at the bottom of your screen. And also, should you want to buy any of Simon or Claudia's wonderful books, they are available also on the tab on your screen. Now I'm going to hand over to our chair, Lucy Silver. Chair Lucy trained and worked as a psychoanalytic psychotherapist. She has been the co-chair of Jewish Book Week since 2011 and directed the festival from 2014 to 2018. She is the perfect chair for this evening. Over to you, Lucy. Thank you very much, Polly. Good evening, everybody. You can see us, we can't see you, but you know, maybe, that, maybe that's not a bad thing. <laughs> All right, here we go. Claudia, this is about you. No one will ever produce a richer or more satisfying feast of the Jewish experience than Claudia Roden. So said Simon Shah in praise of Claudia's book of Jewish food. Claudia Roden is a woman of many talents who became renowned at an early age as Egypt's backstroke champion. She excelled in both maths and science and could have pursued a career in either, but came to London in the 1950s to study at St. Martin's with the intention of becoming an artist. In the end, however, cookery and cookery writing prevailed. Her cookery books, also social and cultural histories, encompass the very best of international cuisine. From the Lebanon to Vilna, the world has her oyster, or perhaps we should say her tagine of lamb with preserved lemons. Her distinctively beautiful voice is known to us all through radio and TV. Claudia was given a Lifetime Achievement Award last year by the Guardian Observer. Going straight to the point, Simon, is not only our renaissance man of culture but he is also a serious foodie as his twitter account attests lockdown has been unable to suppress simon sharma's creativity irrepressible many of you will have seen the first two programs of his superb new series on the romantics and marveled at the inventiveness of his presentation also current is Simon's great gallery tours on Radio 4, where he walks and talks us through some of the world's greatest museums and artists. He also gave us his dream dinner on Radio 4 last week, still available on BBC Sounds, and he served as hors d'oeuvres, little slivers of white fish and smoked salmon on rye that have a distinctly Jewish feel to them. I know Claudia and Simon well, and I'm delighted to be here this evening to interview them about Jewish food. So, my first question is for you, Claudia. 
Your Book of Jewish Food was published in 1996. Jewish food is not exactly what springs to mind. 1986. Oh, sorry, 1986. I'm so sorry. 1968. 1968 was a book of Middle Eastern food. Oh, yeah. No, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So, to continue, Jewish food is not exactly what springs to mind when people think about haute cuisine. So, Claudia, why did Jewish food excite you enough to write this masterwork about Jewish food? I was actually asked to write it. <laughs> by yeah, by my publishers and at the time it was Elizabeth David, Jane Grigson and Jill Norman who were having dinner together and they uh, said well they noticed that in my Middle Eastern book I had several recipes that I said were Jewish dishes for Passover or for, for a Sabbath dish and they suddenly said, well, we really should have, uh, we only know one type of Jewish cuisine, we never knew there were any others. And so they asked, Jill Norman asked me to write it when she was at Penguins. And I said, oh no, there's no such thing. And uh, also, where will I find it? Uh, it seemed a totally impossible thing. Uh, and but then I did take it on and I couldn't stop because I went on and on and on finding more and more things and people kept telling me there's no such thing even my own relatives I have a few relatives I would keep seeing they said well Claudia what are you wasting your life on <laughs> there is no such thing we ate the same things as everybody else in our countries. And yes, but since, since the book came out, everywhere I go to give a talk in synagogue, there's always someone telling me, you forgot. You forgot the Jews of Afghanistan. And there I find them. And you forgot the food of the Jews of, of Holland. Yes, now I've got them. And uh, so not only were all those Jewish foods, there were such a thing, but there's a lot that have been left out. <laughs> mm. And you're still collecting recipes, aren't you, Claudia, for your new book, which I think is going to be called The Med and out next year. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Simon, here's one for you. We know quite a lot about what people ate in general in biblical times, but was the lowly matzah the first food that can be called truly Jewish? Well, even that probably not actually, Lucy. I mean, uh, matzah for a start, it should be said, um, you know, the, the book of Exodus was written uh, 400 years at least after the ostensible Exodus, if indeed the Exodus happen. So we're in the kind of 9th, 10th century BC when the book of Exodus was written. So the unleavened bread, which is undoubtedly part of the Torah and part of that great epic, is likely to have been made of, certainly didn't come in squares, <laughs> it comes out of Manischewitz or Rukuzen. <laughs> no, no. Um, it's likely to be made of primitive kind, the first domesticated grains, einkorn to begin with, and um, uh, einkorn gave way to emma wheat as well. Those were the wheats that were really the grains that were mostly eaten in, uh, in Egypt. And we have a certain amount of knowledge about this very, you know, we, we nowadays think of the Middle East as overwhelmingly kind of rice driven in terms of its grains. But we have um, as a, the first proper documents of what a, a, a self-consciously Hebraic, or if you like, Jewish society, the document, the papyri documents of the Jewish mercenary soldier and family colony of Elephantini in um, on the Upper Nile near Aswan, and there their kind of daily life is quite richly described, and it's very very heavy on breads of different kinds. Now, einkorn and and, and emma wheat would have been these flat, rather grayish discs. Um, which would have been the first matzah, really. So uh, a kind of harder, tougher, 
um, sort of more biscuity-like version of, of the basic shape of, uh, of pita bread. So in the sense in which this was um, a kind of a ritual festival directed kind of food, you could say that was one of the first distinctive distinctive. Um... Thanks very much. Simon, I want to, um, um, the, there'll be people out, uh, out there in the audience who don't know very much about the rules of cash root or kosher cooking. Um, so could you just give us a very brief ex um, explanation? I mean, as brief as you can. And then I want to ask you, has it's kosher... It's dangerous to say as brief as you can to me, as you well know, Lucy. You know. <laughs> Do your, best. Later. Do your best. We've got lots of questions. In your opinion, has kosher cooking stunted the creativity of Jewish food? Those are two different questions. I mean, I can talk yes, about yeah. kosher a bit. There's a but nice kosher food... really for a start, like a lot of the Bible. You know, you know that that, that old joke about um, the 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 uh, rescue ship captain who arrives on a desert island to rescue Mr. Goldberg. And he says, um, well, it's wonderful to pick you up, Mr. Goldberg, but tell me, why do you have two synagogues? And he says, one I go to and the other one I wouldn't be seen dead in. The same thing is true of the Bible. There are two completely different accounts of the creation in Genesis. And similarly, there are two different accounts of Kashrut, one in Leviticus and one in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy was almost certainly written at least a century after Leviticus. And Leviticus is more forgiving, you have to say. Um, the basic rules of cash wrote is that you've got to separate meat and milk. You shall not see the lamb in its mother's milk. Um, there are complicated, which really would be dull, criteria about the animals. You have to have to chew the cards and have a cloven hoof. But then there are all sorts of um, the definition of what is an abomination. Um, the great anthropologist Mary Douglas wrote a great book about purity rights and cleanliness rights. And for the first time, it made sense that really what those biblical rules were all about, what were regarded as anomalous. And for Deuteronomy, flying insects are anomalous because they're creepy crawly things and they're also kind of bird-like. And therefore, Deuteronomy, I think it's uh, chapter 14, says very definitely you shall not eat it. But Leviticus says, no, absolutely not grasshoppers, locusts, katydids, all those kinds of things uh, are perfectly kosher. And one culture that Claudia knows very well, Claudia, you know, supreme ethnologist of Jewish life, Yemeni culture habitually ate locusts, you know. You ate locusts before in effect they ate you or so got rid of all the stuff that were, and, and still do. And interestingly, um, the rabbis in the Talmudic period, you know, being unable to reconcile these two totally different approaches, whether you can eat insects or not, particularly flying insects, mm -hmm. said it's okay to eat it, despite what Deuteronomy says, if it's a tradition in your community, because there was no way they were going to stop Yemeni. There's a Yemeni cookbook I, I have on my shelves. Claudia probably has it as well. And... Um, it, 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 locust, crunchy locust is a very important part of. <laughs> All right. Maybe yeah. we should. Have you tried it, Lucy? Nate, that's great, uh, Simon. Maybe we should leave the second, the second part of yeah. that, of that, the question. And so, Claudia, Claudia, we've just celebrated Jewish New Year, which we call Rosh Hashanah. Tell us about the sort of food your family used to eat on Rosh Hashanah in Cairo. And who would be invited to the festivities? In Cairo. In Cairo. Yes. Well, I was part of a very big extended family. And uh, we used, well, some of us, uh, we had different groups. And we weren't always the ones in my parents who uh, were the hosts. But we also often were. Uh, well... I'm just, uh, uh, yes, there were several things that we wanted to eat was, um, let me see, things that were green to represent new life, mm -hmm. uh, lots of different vegetables, uh, uh, things that were white uh, that represented purity. We also had things that were orange 
and we had a kind of squash that was like a spaghetti squash. It means it had uh, fibers that came apart uh, with which you made a jam because it represented gold. Uh, in, in the Ashkenazi tradition, it is simis that people eat, uh, but we also had... Uh, you know what is, Claudia, for people who don't know? Yes, Eastern European Jewish, uh, but of course, most important of, of all, uh, we had, we did have apple, uh, and we did have honey, but sometimes we just dipped in sugar uh, to represent the sweetness of life, mm. because it was most of the things we ate were symbolic. I should have started with the very symbolic things. In particular, we had to eat the head of something. And here in England, we've started eating a whole fish with the head on. But in Egypt, we ate the head of a lamb. But yeah. if it wasn't the head of a lamb, it was the brains. We would eat brains. I mean, they were wonderful brains are. <laughs> it was a tongue. Or it was something to do with the head. Because they are, the symbolism in Egypt was that we would be at the head. And the okay. Jews should be at the head. But now we have become... Uh, to say that we have to be at the head of doing good deeds. Nice. So that is more acceptable. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, uh, Claudia. Um, what's your, what, uh, this is a bit of an impertinent question, but was your family kosher? No, but nobody was that I knew in Egypt. We were a very lax community, my generation and my parents' generation. But my grandparents' generation were very religious. I mean, there was an uncle who was a Kabbalist, but yes, they were very religious. Sometimes when we visited the older relatives, uh, I didn't go and kiss them because they didn't kiss a girl, even though I was quite young. Uh, but so at a certain point, well, my maybe I won't go into it, but my grandfather explained why he wasn't kosher anymore. And a lot of Jews had a similar explanation. Shall I say it? Yes, yes, if you can, sum it up. <laughs> no, quickly, yes, that my grandfather, they, when they came from Syria, because they came from Syria, they all lived in a quarter with a slaughterer and um, uh, with uh, the synagogues, the Jewish school, everything. And then they moved away to grander districts. And uh, from there, they couldn't, it was very far to keep going to the Jewish district they had been into to buy. Though they went to buy at the market, all kinds of things. And then my grandfather saw the slaughterer going to buy from the Muslim uh, butcher. And so he went and told the, the, uh, the, the slaughterer, uh, or rather the butcher, the Jewish butcher from the city, I can't, how can I come all the way to you when you buy to him? And his explanation was that all the Jews were always, all of them asking for the same cuts. Yes. He couldn't cut, uh, you know, slaughter all these animals just for the cuts. Oh, for the for the fine cut cuts required yeah. by Jews. Okay, and um, Simon, and um, I'm sorry, I'm asking you for the sort of exegesis, generally speaking. So, Simon, Claudia's book of Jewish food divides Jewish cuisine into two overarching categories: Ashkenazi and Sephardi. Again, in two sentences, can you tell? the people in the audience who might not know the difference, um, something about the origins of Ashkenazim and Sephardim. Well, Ashkenazi, you know, just means really, uh, it, it's a description really of Northern European Jewish cultures generally. So Germany, France, the Rhine Valley, extended to Poland, the Pale of Settlement, Sephardim, Mizrahi, there are, there, you know, I think most people know now that there are 
Sephardi community originally was from Spain, Portugal, the Italian community, particularly the Roman community was completely distinctive um, with their own language, in fact, Judeo-Italian. Um, but the whole of the Maghreb, you know, was full of Jewish cultures, but they were, they were very far flung indeed, way beyond Turkey and Persia, both had enormously important cultures with their own food ways and extended all the way to Afghanistan. Indeed, the, the great lost Jewish cuisine has to be from China, from Kaifeng, you know, where Jews had a very powerful presence under the Northern Song Dynasty in the 11th, 12th and 13th century all the way through. And if only, you know, there's that famous joke about, you know, what do Jews eat at Christmas if they're not gonna eat a turkey, answer Chinese food. Really, it's what they do in New York anyway. <laughs> so if only we had those documents of, 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 we know that they kept halachic law in most of the festivals. So it'd be wonderful to know what Jewish Chinese cooking was. The only one missing, I think, or maybe, is it there in your book, um, Claudia? I don't think we have any good sources for it. So you are, yes. I have a, a Chinese scholar <laughs> from well, mainland China, uh, yes, who actually contacted me to say I heard that you are interested. But she had looked into it because she, her work was on Jews. And yeah. so she was particularly interested in Jews. But yeah. she said there was nothing left now. Yeah, there is the only thing that somebody who went to the region, uh, they went there and they bought something that, I forget now the name of a pastry that was supposedly Jewish, but it came with Lithuanian Jews. Who <laughs> well, that doesn't count at <laughs> all. <laughs> you know, Manchuria, there was a lot of Manchurian Jewish culture. I had a great aunt who lived in Harbin. But for example, I give you this is a rather nice story that when um, we thought, when I was making a story of the Jews, we wanted to film a particular community which had been boiled down to one person in Kochi, a woman called Sarah Cohen. So this is not the great Iraqi, Calcutta, Mumbai connection, which produced sumptuous and prolific and gastronomically very creative cultures. This is the culture of, of South India, of Kochi and, and Kerala. Um, and they had their own particular food ways. And you can go to Kochi, some of you listening or watching may have done this, and you still see it makes one cringe a little bit, Jew Town, it's actually called that. And the beautiful Paradisi Synagogue, um, which is, oh, which was begun during the period of Portuguese and Dutch incursion and has decorative elements from them all. And they went to see Sarah Cohen, who I think, I, I know she was very, this is 10 years ago and she was already pushing 90, but she was very determined and uh, a tough, tough old bird. And then we were interrupted by this young Muslim man, actually, mm -hmm. in a not very Muslim part of India, who, who had brought her um, Friday dinner in the Kochi style. And he, in fact, was doing a doctorate on, on Carolan Jewish cooking. And, um, and Sarah was his principal source, actually. So, um, S-O-U-R-C-E. Um, so these food ways went absolutely everywhere. I just want to say one thing about, you know, obviously Ashkenazi cooking is uh, uh, much, originally much more familiar, um, heavy in starch, in potatoes, um, in pickled foods, in salted foods. Oh, by the way, actually, one, to go back to my favorite subject, um, one traveler's midrashic account in the Middle Ages described locusts being pickled, actually, as well, in Egypt. So locusts were everywhere. Um, Sephardi food is, is the glory of the, the, the sort of things that, that Claudia writes about so beautifully over and over again. But, but what I want to say is there's one aspect to the ritual of Jewish life, which is a crossover moment, I think. Claudia may disagree between Ashkenazi and Sephardi cooking. You, you're not supposed to start cooking on the Sabbath, on Shabbat. So uh, both in the classic Sephardi cuisines of Spain and Portugal before the expulsion in 1492 and in the Ashkenazi world of Poland, uh, you were, were very stew-driven. Stew you took your pot of um, a, a, a meat and uh, a, a meaty stew with lots of vegetables, sometimes with semolina, and whether it was adafina in, in the Lusitanian and Iberian world, or whether it was cholent 
in the um, in the in the Ukrainian and Polish world, you then put it in the baker's oven and it stayed there. So you weren't actually doing the cooking, and you retrieved it during the Sabbath, having not cooked it, and because it was slow cooking, it was still hot and delicious. And my mother was one of the. It was a it was a tradition in the Ashkenazi community all over Ashkenazi Jewish world, but in into London as well. Uh, in the early part of the 20th century for children to go and pick up the, the cholent pot, which my mother certainly did. And it was one of the few things that my mother herself was actually brilliant at doing. Her cholent was, was uh, prize winning. And um, I'm not crazy about Ashkenazi cooking myself, but I do love a perfectly made cholent. <laughs> Claudia, even I think in your book, you describe that even in your parents' time, they still took the pot, didn't they? To, to to the to the to the yeah communal yeah. oven no because we when i was born we were oh, we well when i was little we were living in a little island that's residential and it's now one of the grand areas of living and there weren't a communal oven i beg your pardon uh, it is the grandparents in, day it is in the jewish quarter there was uh, the public bus and the public bus uh, they always had a fire to warm the water, to heat the water. And at night, the, it was the dying uh, coals that w people would go and put their pots in. Mm -hmm. But it was the people in the Jewish quarter. Mm -hmm. By the way, uh, when I was saying that, people were always telling me we missed out and uh, you know when I was speaking at the Sephardi synagogue by the way I called the whole uh, part of my book Sephardi although now we call them Mizrahi but at one time in Israel they called everybody who wasn't Ashkenazi Sephardi mm -hmm. uh, but they because they moved um, the Sephardim, or the people I called Sephardim, they moved from east to west and backwards and forwards, but not north to where the Ashkenazi were. So they had uh, contacts and cultural sort of hybridization between themselves. So there was something common about their food, which wasn't between the Ashkenazi and, and the Sephardi. But uh, with um sorry what did you ask that that, that no the, um, um that that's absolutely fine and, and and very interesting claudia you've both been rather rude in your own way at various times yeah. about ashkenazi cooking yeah. and claudia claudia you described it in your book i mean this is a summing up kind of all carrots and dumplings and and grayness but boiling hot have you changed your mind over the last 20 uh, five years about Ashkenazi uh, cooking. Yes, no, no, but all the way I did love many, many dishes and I still eat them when I can. But I have to say that the Ashkenazim themselves don't think much of their food. Okay. And if you see in Israel, I was there at a conference that was called many, many years ago, long before my Jewish book, which was called couscous or gefilte fish and it was they had asked people from various communities to come and cook in Jerusalem we were in this hotel uh, glad hotel where we had to be watched by uh, by um, uh, what you call them sort of uh, making sure that you were doing everything kosher but um, but yes at the end of it there was a big, big party where the, because we had to cook as well as talk and people had to have a taste. But at the end, there was a big dinner in a restaurant called, I forget now, I forget names, but uh, on one side was all the Sephardi food, on the other was the Ashkenazi food. And all the Ashkenazim came to eat at the Sephardi. <laughs> and none of the Sephardim went to, cook, uh, eat at the Ashkenazi table. But actually there is now, there has been lots of changes. And at the beginning in Israel, at the beginning of the state, they didn't want 
a Sephardi food. Sephardi food was despised and it wasn't considered Jewish. Mm -hmm. It was considered ethnic. Mm -hmm. uh, Jewish food was considered Jewish, um, but it was despised as well because it represented a food of oppression and a food of, be, it had to be forgotten and left behind. And the food that they considered Israeli was uh, hummus um, uh, and uh, hummus and falafel and all those things, which they found already there. But actually, one person told me there is only one food you can say is truly at that time Israeli, and it was a turkey schnitzel. Turkey schnitzel. Well, it's sort of, I, I want to just sort of complicate things a little bit. Um, <laughs> I must remember that, you know, at the turn of the century, around 1900, for example, whether the food was horrible then. Uh, Jerusalem had a, a, an enormous Jewish majority. There were about 70,000 Jews to about 15,000 Palestinians. They were a small, very, very small minority in, in, the, in, uh, in Palestine, Israel overall, but they were a serious majority. In, and it would be, I don't want to give the impression that you know, Ashkenazi food throughout is something, I, I think despised is, is quite a strong word, really. Um, you know, there, there is... Well, there was a wonderful Ashkenazi bakery near the Lion Gate in the old city that's been going since the Yeshuv, since the 1920s. And you will not find a more sumptuous array of pastries. I, if I was doing it, and you're right to say that I, I held my nose a bit at Ashkenazi cooking. My own family, unlike Claudia, was a mixture of both. Um, and originally from Izmir, the Shamas were, went to Botoshani in Romania, where a lot of intermarriage with the Ashkenazim happened. But Romania was one place, Botoshani in particular, where there were Ashkenazi and Sephardi um, households who, who mixed regularly, including the ingredients of their kitchens. And, um, you know, there are some things I'm tempted, I mean, it is gefilte fish gets a terrible rap and usually deserved and there's nothing more ghastly than these gray soggy lumpen cement like things with their little kind of carrot yarmulke their little carrots sitting on top but gefilte fish is only it is right it's very close to canel de brochet isn't it yeah. it's actually a dumpling of finely ground fish, if your fish is good, if you add egg whites, whipped egg whites to it, if you're careful about the spice and you don't over poach it, these things can be actually- I hope your great. audience, I hope you're listening very carefully in the audience. Claudia, you wanted to add something. I wanted to add something. I have to say that I'm talking about a certain period and yes. everything has changed in Israel, including Ashkenazi food has become very, very fashionable. I think yeah. already 15 years ago or 20 years ago, but it became fashionable through the American gourmet magazine or um, New York Times and all the, all, uh, it was the American deli food and the American idea of Jewish food that made uh, uh, Ashkenazi food become the soul food of the elites, because Good. they were the powerful elites of Israel. The ants of my childhood in, in Glasgow were incomparable cooks, and I still haven't tasted anything that, that you know, that, that compares. And Simon, <laughs> back to your partly Ashkenazi roots, you spent the latter half of your childhood in Golders Green. What was in your lunchbox? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is really embarrassing, Lucy. I thought, well, um, <laughs> Lucy's uh, Lucy's um, Lucy Lucy was uh, grew up as Lucy Cohen. I think that's right, isn't it? Yeah, mm -hmm. indeed. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, and um, but no relation to the staggeringly great smoked salmon purveyor on Golders Green Road called um, Cohen Smoked Salmon. It was um, was that still there when you? I don't think it was when you arrived. Claudia, but anyway, it was really, really very good, at least in my childhood memory. 
But my mother, you know, because I did not do school uh, lunches, really. I had packed lunches, as you say, Lucy. And it was, um, it was always, always smoked salmon <laughs> with a, sometimes a smear of cream cheese on it on rye bread every single day. And I was sort of, you know, um, I think it was the point. I hadn't realized that this was kind of luxury food and would infuriate, you know, my my mates in the 19, my non-Jewish mates in the 1950s, bloody Jews with their smoked salmon. So I think it was probably at the moment when I opened my sandwich box and said, oh no, this was a terrible thing to say, not smoke salmon again. Oh, <laughs> my best friend, a fellow called Sid Harris, took his open blade pencil sharpener and snatched it away and started not to eat my smoked salmon sandwich, but to tear it. It was a kind of sandwich pogrom that actually happened. So I attempted to retrieve the and and got my hands freshly sliced. I still it's no good me putting it up to the camera because it's very faint now, but I still bear the scar, 12 stitches actually, of of this um personal attack on my smoked salmon sandwich. You could have swapped and given poor Sid a taste of your daily fare, couldn't you? Yeah, terrible. That actually never occurred to me, you know, because I didn't realize yeah. it was an annoyingly luxurious food. My mum did. I just to remind everybody to submit questions, and there will be time for questions, so do send them in, and um, we'll look forward to them later on. Claudia, on a more serious I note, perhaps. I want to add something oh, uh, in the sense of not being prejudiced and all that. But of course, when we think of Jewish food and the shtetl, it's the one kind of food. But then there was all the kinds of foods that came out of Hungary and Austria mm -hmm. and that joined the Ashkenazi food culture with, you know, some of the grandest foods of the world. So good. I don't think... With any Ashkenazi no, uh, I, Yes, I just know it's, it's very good, very good point, Lucy, to say, for example, there's a there's a dumpling crescent, oh, which yeah. is essentially Hungary and Bohemia. So Hungary and Czechoslovakia. And you think, oh, but of course the dumplings can be again, you know, like a filter fish can, if you know how to cook it properly, very light and very refined. And there are slavery dumplings and you know, gorgeous kind of cherry and fruit dumplings. And that's a particular subset of the Ashkenazi world. Right. So moving on a little bit um, to a different, different area. Claudia, under the Spanish Inquisition, Jews had to give evidence that they'd become good Catholics, that they truly converted. Did food have a role here? Yes. Uh, well, because uh, uh, a lot of women were brought before the court of the Inquisition and they were reported by an, an, uh, a jealous or uh, somebody who had a grudge against them. It could be their maid or it could be the neighbor. But the one thing that they were brought in for, uh, which is in the courts of the Inquisition in the archives, is was always about food. Uh, apart from things like candles, they might be using candles, but it was always food. And there were some, of course, the main thing was that they didn't eat, if they didn't eat enough ham or bacon or pork. And so everybody was putting pork of some kind in their dishes. And uh, it became uh, such a... Uh, such an important thing, or rather, uh, for the whole population, not just the Jews, people who were old Christians, not just the new Christians, uh, and the, the Muslims who had converted as well, uh, they all put pork in, so as not to be taken as a possible Jew. And it has influenced the food of... Uh, of uh, Spain. This is why wherever you go, you rarely find a soup or a salad or, or even any vegetable dish without something, either a little piece of, of pork somewhere or just the pork fat on it is, is there. But, uh, but the food that they had at that time, I 
uh, I was I heard about several of the dishes that were mentioned as Jewish dishes, uh, and one of them was uh, what you call it, ah, the an aubergine and cheese gratin. Do you know that, uh, yes. Simon? Yes. Uh, berenjena con queso. I think so. Uh, but but the thing is, I found it in Turkey. Uh, it is the favorite dish of the Jews of Turkey. And uh, it is so extraordinary that that was a dish that actually brought a lot, a lot of trouble to women in Turkey if they cooked it. But here they brought it to Turkey. But in Spain, they would have been. <laughs> and that's great, Claudia. And actually, bringing in Turkey, I've just got a question for you, Simon, um, um, about the Ottoman Empire. Um, could you tell us how food... Food questions, Lucy. Sorry? Yeah, kind of ask an historian questions, really. Well, uh, you could... Okay. No. Come in at the end. Yeah. What do you want to know about the Ottoman Empire? Yeah. Okay, what I wanted to know is something about the relationship between the Jews and the and Sultan Selim II. Oh, yeah. Okay. 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 So yeah, that's... Well, yeah. well, they, they, one of the Jews who became very important who originally was Portuguese um, from the Mondes family, who became a kind of treasurer and a kind of uh, sort of deputy vizier to, Sul to Selim II, was also, we know this, was also the great caterer. Salim II was notoriously corpulent, and um, particularly after prayers on Friday, liked to gorge on this very complicated and delicious kind of abundance of food that was both savory and sweet. And um, and Mandez was, who was known as the great Jew, was had an enormous caravan which used to go all the way through the different courtyards of Top Kapi to deliver this. So. Um, yeah, I think I began. That's 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 kind of you. So, um, so <laughs> I apologise for, <laughs> for the, saying I'm getting all the questions. So, in fact, there's a chapter about uh, there's there are a couple of pages about this in in uh, volume two of my Jewish history. There are, and the, and the um, one about the great catering. But I, you know, um, it was interesting though to switch it slightly that um, within this very kind of mixed up food world of my Sharma grandparents, my mother Steinberg grandparents weren't mixed up at all because that was really purely Lithuanian Ashkenazi food. But in the more kind of mixed up Balkan tradition, um, there, were, there, was, there were foods that came absolutely, I mean, one that's very, that I, I, th I think I'm right in saying, Claudia will correct me, called, we used to call it, my grandmother Sarah called it frittata and it was basically, kind of ground up chicken patties actually, but chicken is important and you you ground it up. You, um, I, I think some sort of dill was used, which I don't like very much, but it was ground up with onion in the way in which kind of beef patty would and it'd be fried. But it was, I remember served with rice by my by my grandmother and it was, it was something um, that she certainly said anyway, originally came that, that her husband, who, as I say, my grandfather died before I was born, particularly liked and was a kind of Izmiri thing. And, so, and my mother inherited that, and she made that sort of very well, too. And it was always called a frittata, and sometimes yeah, yeah. come with kind of braised tomatoes yeah. and, some, and yeah, pepper. Yeah. I think she to wants to tell us something. Yes. I feel, yeah. I wish I could bring the portrait that I've got downstairs of my great-grandfather, because he was the chief rabbi of Aleppo. And he is, uh, he was, um, uh, he was made the chief, he was given the post by the Sultan Abdel Hamid. And he has, uh, 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 he's there in a, what is he called? <laughs> uh, his robes and his kaftan and his, um, his um, turban and uh, all the medals given to him up from Abdel Hamid. And so we did feel, uh, as not only from Aleppo, but from the uh, uh, Istanbul part of the family, that we were Ottoman and <laughs> in a big way. And uh, from all the different parts, 
we inherited all these dishes. Mm -hmm. And I could say, yes, this is where we are from. This is we, who we are, and this is what family. we get. We, we were had a very brief period in Vienna. I think actually some of my great, great uncles lived in Vienna. And uh, there was a saying that where Sharmas lived, empires fell. And <laughs> <laughs> the Ottoman Empire fell, followed by the Habsburg Empire, as we know, followed by the British Empire. And hey, here I am in New York. <laughs> so the bad <laughs> spell is not right. Yeah. Simon, okay. um, I was going to ask you when did Jewish cooking first come to Britain, but you put me off. Okay. So, but. <laughs> No, I mean, there's the famous fish and chips thing, really, which is only half right. Chips, fried potatoes were not, absolutely not part of, unless, unless Claudia corrects me, as far as I know, were not part of Sephardi cooking. Fried fish, of course, absolutely was. And um, fried fish certainly was sold on the streets of 18th century London. And the first time, which is rather wonderful, I think, actually, um, that Jewish cooking was sort of recognized in the publication that I know of and celebrated was in Eliza Acton's cookbook, uh, which I'm sure the British Library's got lots of first editions of. Um, uh, cooking for Private Houses, I think it's called 1845. And the very last chapter, you can read it online actually, everybody, um, is called Jewish and Foreign Cooking. And I love, <laughs> love the idea that before you get to foreign cooking, there is Jewish cooking. And there's a celebration of not only of fried fish, of, in other words, gefilte fish, it, it is improved by being fried, but eaten cold the following day. For example, fish like pink fish, like salmon, actually, apparently was fried by Jewish communities and then eaten cold for breakfast or for lunch um, the following day. The other, the other dish, there are two other kinds of Jewish cooking which are celebrated in Eliza Acton's work. Um, one are the use of pounded almonds, of almond flour, as a substitute for wheat flour. And obviously that arose out of Passover practice when you weren't allowed to um, have um, le leavened types of pastries. And salt beef, what, what Eliza Acton called smoked beef, but actually is kind of pickled or salt beef, which she says, without meaning to be offensive, said it's so good that it resembles the flavor of a perfectly cured ham, really, which wasn't the best way probably to celebrate it. But, but this, that, that, that was a kind of- This is quite nice. This is quite nice because this leads us um, to, to, to talking a little bit about, um, and this is for you, Claudia, how and why was the deli first introduced to New York in the, in the early 20th century? Who did it cater for? Actually, uh, I'm just trying to think, well, it started really in the 19th century. And uh, it was, uh, uh, let me see, where did I say? Yes. I'm just going to say. I can't answer the phone, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I remind you, sorry, I've I've got, you Claudia. Um, Claudia, you said that yes. it's the purpose yes. of the, of the, of the Jewish deli. Yeah, well, yeah. it was when, can I just say? <laughs> uh, no. It, it just makes a funny noise. No, but, all right, but I'm just, going to, I'm just going to say this for you, Claudia. I yeah. think no, it was when the pogroms in Russia, and there was this mass of 2,300,000 uh, Russian Jews arrived in America. And many, they arrived from shtetls, and they came and they lived in tenements, and many of them were males, were men on their own, and uh, uh, they couldn't uh, they couldn't afford to go out to places to, to eat. They wanted to eat their own food and neighbors started cooking for them and giving them food. And that gradually it started lots of places where they cooked the kind of foods that they had- They had at home. In at home. At home. And, um, and gradually they became, uh, there were more and more people and families where the women went to work also couldn't cook at home. So the deli became a, a very important uh, 
part of, of American Jewish life. And, and somehow that kind of food that was created at the time when they were between the shtetl and the tenement, that became the idea of Jewish food, that the menu of the, of the deli until today uh, from the salt beef, there were the, there were different kinds of uh, of uh, delis. There were the meat ones, and then there were the fish ones with the, which were called dairy, uh, and um, that had fish and and uh, creams and uh, various deli things. Uh, so they specialized in different things. One thing that happened in New York that uh, was born in New York is the pastrami, because mm -hmm. it, people say it's something that is Romanian, but it's not. The Jews in Romania didn't make it that way. It was something completely unique of New York. Now, we're going to throw this open to, to, to the audience in, in, in a minute. So I've got, I've got a sort of last question for both of you. And um, so Claudia and Simon, um, perhaps starting with Claudia, can you tell us about this new wave of Middle Eastern cook, cooking, which is led by Yota Motilengi and his Palestinian partner, Sami Tamimi, and Sarit Packer and Itamar Srulevich of Honey and Co. Do you think, Claudia, you might have influenced their cuisine in any way? Yes, because they say so. Yeah, they say that, yeah, it was their, uh, their bedside reading every night <laughs> to get inspiration. Uh, but because it was the my Middle Eastern book, was uh, translated into Hebrew um, very early on. It's 50 years ago. And as your time says, he was born the year that um, in the year that my first book came out. <laughs> and in Israel, it was the first book that actually had Middle Eastern recipes. Mm -hmm. And well, I do find that all the chefs there. I had a, an award uh, at the Jewish Film Festival or Jerusalem Film Festival um, for the influence I had. And then I went to for the award and several chefs invited me uh, to special dinners that they made and said, you know, that the book was where they had their original source material. Well, somehow that's unsurprising. Um, Simon, would you like to add anything about the kind of cooking that Ottolenghi, for instance, and Sami Tamimi present in Jerusalem? Or I think you're... Well, I, I think, that, yes, I think the book is a wonderful book because, again, in the spirit of, of Claudia's um, work, it's it, it, there's a lot of kind of folk history in it, as it were, and um, it does indeed go back to the days which we can be possibly over nostalgic about. Well, you know, uh, be, because it seems to be a lost golden age where Jews and Arabs in cities like Jerusalem, Jews and Palestinians in cities like Jaffa and um, and Jerusalem, sort of shared a lot of food culture, and uh, um, you know, there's a lot of that in 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 the book on Jerusalem. It's a wonderful evocation of if those of you who don't know it, um, the Machine Yehuda food market, which is absolutely an incredible place, one of the greats, rather like the Boccaria in, in Barcelona. Um, it's, it's, it's one of the great, extraordinary kind of food markets of, of the world. But the, 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 there are weird phenomena. For example, um, I, read a, I read a small story in, in, here in New York that one in four Americans buys hummus every week from their supermarket. <laughs> this is sort of absolutely extraordinary. And originally hummus was, in the idea that it might be, it was meant again for, rather, rather in the spirit of um, Claudia's history of how Delhi started in New York, it was originally made by a man called Norman Zohar in the 1980s, in the mid and late 1980s for, um, Israelis, there were a large Israeli expatriate community in New York who wanted to be reminded of the 
hummus back home. And it kind of caught on so successfully that the business grew and grew and grew and eventually was bought by PepsiCo, by the makers of Pepsi-Cola, who delivered, I think it was 12 million free samples to supermarkets all over the country. Extraordinary. Quite explain. Although, I, although I have to say my first introduction to uh, hummus in the 1970s was, was via the, the Arab restaurants in Jaffa, and I don't think that that Tel Aviv or would you know produce quite the same kind of stand quality of hummus. I, I don't know that I've really found it elsewhere. As Simon, you would like to. I'm very purist about hummus. I like to make my own and cook my oh, chickpeas. Of course you do, Simon. Of course you do. And of course you would like to give us your recipe. And of course you would like to give us your recipe for chicken soup. But I, I think you're going to have to put them up on your website, unfortunately, because there's a lot of people out there with a lot of questions for you. So before I turn to them, just quickly, Claudia, you've got... Yeah, yes. I just want to say yes. I think what is uh, happening with your thumb and all these others, but primarily your time, they have created a Middle Eastern nouvelle cuisine that is absolutely wonderful. And that keeps changing because it is like uh, the global cultures today are, uh, are creative and they have to keep creating. And some like your time have uh, incredible magic about what they do and do it extremely well and I find this is particularly upsetting to Middle Eastern restaurants that are Turkish and Lebanese and all that who always do the same traditional thing their menu is set in stone and they find that these people young chefs or older chefs mm -hmm. from Israel feel free to do uh, not, uh, they can use anything from any Jewish community, whether it's Yemenite or Persian and, and, uh, and feel free to do what they want with it. And so what they are doing has made a huge uh, impact on, on international global uh, gastronomy or cuisine. Wonderful. Um, you may have an opportunity to, to sort of expand on this and various other things that we've touched upon. But now I'd like to open it to the floor. And here's the first question from Cheryl. And she doesn't actually specify um, who, is, who this question is to. So either of you could, could pick it up. As someone who was brought up on Jewish food and still appreciates it, in what ways do you think that Jewish food changes and adapts or is capable of change? It's a little bit like you were just just mentioning, in fact, Claudia, in relation to... Yeah. 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 I mean, uh, in America, it changes, it can change completely because people there feel you have to be creative. And they do, for instance, latkes with courgette. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it has nothing to do with the latkes that we know. But in France, uh, people, uh, uh, when I gave a recipe uh, using a different fish for gefilte fish, uh, I had, there was uproar that I had to change it in my French edition because the French are traditionalists. Uh, but here it just changes with what is available. Here's a question for Simon from Philip Coles. Simon, um, you mentioned locusts. Did John the Baptist eat, eat insects or carob beans? Uh, right. I'm, the, I'm absolutely unqualified to answer the question, not having been there at the time. <laughs> and this, I, I have no idea. It's, I, I don't mean to blow the question off, actually. But, no, no, um, that's but, yeah, certainly we know that locusts were, you know, that we don't even know if they were consumed in biblical times. We know they were consuming um, plague of locusts, but we certainly do know that in very ancient Jewish communities in Yemen and indeed in Ethiopia, um, you know, it was absolutely standard. I mean, as I say, Yemeni cookbooks 
um, you know, survive from a, quite a long time ago, from the 18th and 19th century. So when the first Jewish rediscovery of Yemenite Jews occurs in the later part, or in the middle and the later part of the 19th century, they certainly discover that, you know, locusts are part of, it will basically be your happy hour snack. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, here is a question from Aaron Valance. Uh, fascinating evening. I would love to know whether there are any dishes specific to the Jewish community in Britain that you don't see anywhere else. I guess that's for either of you. Claudia. Yes, uh, it is the, the fried gefilte fish. Exactly. You don't see it anywhere else. Mm. Um, and it, because like the, the fried fish uh, in batter, it came with the Portuguese Jews who came to England, I think in the 18th century. And uh, it is the way of uh, frying in batter is something that the Portuguese has brought even to Japan, but they, the Jews brought it here. But uh, that they started also frying gefilte fish because everywhere else gefilte fish is just stewed white. And, uh, and so this is the only place that you can find that. Did you want it's to very, add I would counsel, I don't, I don't know about you, Claudia, but I would counsel people trying it <laughs> outside the Jewish community, not actually to have a full on batter, really, but actually just to dredge yes. like a filter with ground fish with onions and spices, whatever you want to do it in matzo meal or in panko breadcrumbs or something like that. That's actually what my mother did, and it's what, That's and it would be yeah. little tiny little cocktail fish yeah. balls, they're called, or <laughs> large patties, yeah. and they're both very good. And they stay good, mysteriously, um, for days afterwards, at they least. You know. But yeah. actually, yes, now that's the way most of the Jews do it. But when Eliza Acton gave recipes of fish, fried fish, she called fish in the Jewish manner. It was a batter. It was a batter. Well, yeah. is that ground fish though, or whole, you know, which would yeah, be fish? It was a whole fish. fish. It was oh, a well, fillet. It was yes, a fried well, fish. Yes, yeah. well, that would be, right, that yeah. would be fish and chips fish, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we have written that, yeah. So here is a question from Wynne Brown. She says, can you tell me anything about the kinds of food eaten by African Jews, or was it basically the same as other Jewish traditions? I'm thinking particularly of Ethiopian Jews. Um, well, I know that, I mean, as far as I know about it, actually, and again, I'm working again on the, the rediscovery of Ethiopian Jews, first of all, by a great Karaite ethnologist in the 1890s. And he describes food in the Jewish community, which is ritually slaughtered, but is indistinguishable from the kind of food um, eaten, um, you know, by, by the rest of the Ethiopians. One particular case in point being in Jera, you know, this extraordinary kind of rather, I don't know how we all feel about in Jera, not my favorite kind of thing, um, but it is, it is where you mop up meat stews. In Jera is a, again, a kind of unleavened bread, very spongy. Claudia, how does it get to be so spongy and cloth-like and, um, and yeah. certainly Ethiopian Jews around Gondar. Gondar is a great Ethiopian, was the center of most of the Ethiopian um, Jewish community. And they were the first people who went yeah. talk about using injera rather than clay or to kind of mark meats, which seem to be sort of indistinguishable from I think, yes, students of other kinds. Again, I, yeah. I, I know. About that. Yeah. Is that uh, what you understand too? Yeah. But there are, of course, now communities. There are communities now, the Abudaya community in Uganda, which is quite an important and very distinctive Jewish community. Um, and um, I think all the rest of you have, are you all there? You're frozen, you seem to be a bit frozen, or maybe it's me who's frozen. Yes. But the Abudaya community also has, uh, I think, developed slight, as I understand it, Jewish variations on what standard East African food yeah. is. I mean, there is a uh, quite a thriving, there was, uh, Jewish community in the Sudan, but they were of 
Iraqi and Syrian origin. And so their food was uh, something, also they adapted it to things that they found there. But I don't know of something purely African myself, uh, apart from the Ethiopian ones. That Lucy, did you want to say something? My niece has a cafe in Tel Aviv actually, and um, where the chefs are Eritrean, and so that the food is Eritrean, yeah. Oh, God. And then once or twice a week, they also um, put on Eritrean music. So if anybody wants any details, I can supply them later. Polly. Uh, this is a question from Rebecca. What would you say distinguishes Jewish food from the other food native to a place? Is it mainly that it is shaped by kosher laws? For me, or yes, uh, yes. Uh, I think, um, uh, yes, I find that very often Jews come from a country and think that they eat exactly the same thing. And then you find out from the people in the country who aren't Jewish have realized how different their food was. But for instance, uh, the reason why it's different, yes, it has to do partly with the kosher laws that uh, uh, they use oil instead of butter or else um, um, goose fat instead of pork fat. So there's a different in, uh, in taste, but there are, for instance, the, the Sephardi Passover cakes are made all with almonds. There is that kind, but there is something else and that the Jews moved before anybody else was migrating, they were migrating for all the various reasons of, 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 uh, uh, of work, of trade, uh, of persecution, but they brought uh, something from one country to another and it created a mix of two cultures, um, uh, sometimes of three cultures and you find it in various, in various countries. In some countries like in Turkey, the food remained very different. Although the Jews who came from Spain because the majority or great number went straight from Spain to, to Turkey. And they kept until recently their, their food of Spain. In, in an unbelievable way, which I researched quite a lot, but they didn't, didn't stop them from eating shish kebab and pilafs, from adopting foods from, from uh, Turkey as well. But I remember at a conference, a Turkish gastronom uh, said, can Claudia tell us why I'm 50 years old that was a few several years ago, and I have uh, I have never eaten the Jewish food of Turkey, and the Jews have been here. He knew a lot of Jews. Well, he had to go and eat in their homes, but now I must say that it has got into restaurants that there are Jews and caterers or people who learn from Jews, and they sell to restaurants. Uh, the specialities of Jews. That is uh, I just add something really that Claudia was saying yesterday when we were having a preliminary conversation. There are certain um, foods which were unknown in the ancient world. Artichokes, for example, were not known to the Romans or Greeks, even though we think of them as kind of, you know, quintessentially, I don't know, quintessentially, certainly Mediterranean or pan European. And, and Claudia's book, and Claudia mentioned this yesterday, uh, because the Jews were living in Sicily, um, they, they got artichokes from Arab, the Arab culinary world and brought them into Italy. So, you know, Jewish artichokes at Cartography Judea had that kind of, um, had, had that sort of distinctive migratory route. And the same thing with melanzane, with, with aubergines as well, actually. So uh, very often it's, it's a matter of what the Jews carry. From. There, are, there are tiny little variations, for example, uh, something I rather like, bialis, which you may in Britain know, it's, they're, they're quite well known in New York, which are not the same as bagels or bagels. 
Um, they're flat, they're, they're, they're round, but they're flat and they're solid, no hole in the middle. There's a little depression in the middle, which is usually filled with, um, with slightly caramelized softened onion um, shreds. They're very, very good if they're done properly. And that was distinctive, not just to Poland, but to Bialystok in particular, hence the name. So, and certainly wasn't, there was nothing else like it in, in the, the Polish bread basket. Um, as far as I know. That is just <coughs> wonderful. Thank you both for such rich answers. Um, just a quick note here. Um, hi, Lucy, we're watching from Tel Aviv and we would love the details of your niece's cafe. So perhaps... <laughs> <laughs> it's on Ben Yehuda, but I doubt that it's open at the moment, sadly. It used to be the journalist cafe on Ben Yehuda and I will find the details. Anybody can, um, I don't know, they can contact me actually at lucy at jewishbookweek.com. There we go. I'm going to be inundated. Um, okay, here's here is a question from Adam Lieber. Why do you think Ashkenazi food never got the uptake and glamorization in the UK that we see in New York and the USA? And do you think ha um, Hasidism appreciate the quality seen across the pond or from the developments within the food from the younger chefs? I think. Why do you think th this question about Ashkenazi food? Uh, about having the uptake and glamorization in the UK versus across the pond. Ashkenazi food was never glamorized in America, that's for sure, <laughs> despite the spectacular globalization of the bagel, which is another yeah. comparable to hummus, but I haven't done the kind of food ways research on that. It was never glamorized. It was always, you know, the same stuff turned out at weddings and bar mitzvahs, and it made it into Hollywood. I think actually what your questioner might have in mind are, you know, scenes in various Hollywood movies, really, with the Jewish Cohen brothers or whatever it is, of people <laughs> that inevitably family feuding catastrophic bar mitzvahs, really, where gefilte of fish and smoked salmon and, you know, various kinds of slightly suicidal chicken, you know, were presented, really. But it was never really glamorized, but it was popularized. So it's, um, I, it, that's simply because the Jewish community, whether in the film industry, the entertainment industry, or in the catering industry, you know, was very, it was sentimentalized, I think is the proper word. Um, place like Barney Greengrass, which is still a wonderful place for every conceivable kind of smoked fish, not just white fish, but sturgeon, and not just smoked yeah. salmon, but white fish and sable and sturgeon on Amsterdam Avenue is a place where people go to remember, you know, their grandparents' stories from Brooklyn and the Lower East Side. Um, there were, of course, places like that in London. There was um, the great salt beef cafes of, of Blooms and um, the great Bagel Emporia. There is still one there, but it, it, it's, uh, it keeps on being resurrected in a slightly different version. Um, in I think, yeah, because Ashkenazi, yeah. well, Jewish culture in America was such a big thing that, yeah. you know, the comedians, the comedians were at the weddings and they were at the hotels in the hills, right. with whatever, and they were talking about food all the time. It was their jokes and their things, and it's got into Hollywood talk and American talk. It's sort of, uh, so it is because the community there was so powerful. It was the golden community, Jewish community of the world. Yeah. There's a story of the, of the, the visitor to a very excessively lavish bar mitzvah. Um, who is, um, you know, who, who goes into the main dining room and is astonished to see uh, a full sculpture of the Bar Mitzvah boy down in potato kugel. And, um, and, and someone says, mm, um, is, is that, um, you know, is, 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 that, uh, kugel, is that sculpture by Zadkin? And the host said, no, no, Zadkin only works in chopped liver. You know, <laughs> Um, Polly, I don't know whether, whether we've got time for any more questions, but kind of this links in, and I think it's quite, it's just arrived on my, on my phone, and it's from Omar Patillo. What did Ashkenazis eat before we knew about potatoes for latkes? They used, uh, uh, they didn't do latkes. No. Uh, they did other oh. fried things. Ah. But yes, they didn't have. I mean, it's, it's, a kind of thing. 
Yeah, it's a Hanukkah theme because of the, you know, the miracle of the oil. The miracle of the oil, by the way, is not in the book of Maccabees. It was an invention by yeah. the Mishnah and the Talmudists much later on. But he was supposed to eat something in oil. And a very good example of the radically divergent food ways is in the Sephardi world, you eat oil, oil fried donuts, sufkan yachts, with, uh, with jam filling. Um, and as you rightly imply, you know, as the questioner rightly implies, potatoes were kind of unknown in a, a yeah. lot of the world until the late 18th century. So luck is, luck is fairly recent invention, in fact. Yeah, and yes, in the Sephardi world as well, it's a kind of lucumades, uh, yeah. la lavia. They're little fritters. Uh, yeah, and so do the Moroccans as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know how much time we, we've got, Polly. I wanted to actually have the final question, if I may, um, yeah, which is uh, for both of you, what food could you not what what would be your least dispensable food? What food could you not live without? Science. Without, without. without. what I food? Really food what food, what food, food do I like the least in Jewish culture? What Jewish? What food do you like the most? What food do I like the most in Jewish? In, in Jewish quiz food. Oh yeah, you go first because <laughs> <laughs> Simon's floored. I, like any Simon. I feel having, you know, like 3,000 recipes that I've tried over the years, I yeah. can't say one. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's too difficult as a food writer <laughs> because I've got too many. Not a recipe, but a food like, I think Nigella said roast chicken, for instance. She, I yeah, but I think particularly in Jewish. Is it not particularly Jewish? No, I mean, roast chicken, you know, poulet rôti, it's sort of particularly, oh, exactly. it's true, I couldn't it's, live without roast but chicken. Even I that, is, 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 is it as good as kosher, um, as kosher chicken, kosher roast chicken? Is it especially good as kosher yes. chicken? No. Yes. No. Yes. Is it the same? It depends what you, on, what depends on different things, whether it's good or not. I do like chopped liver. I do make chopped liver. Could I live without it? Maybe I could. I, I, I love do. it. I do. I do. I, I do. Love I do. It too. You love chopped liver. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Polly, do you think, do you think that time's up? I, th I think very it's sadly, yeah. time, I think really sadly, time is up. I can't thank you enough. Lucy, you've done the most beautiful job and yeah, Given yeah. the difficulty of this technology, it nevertheless feels like we've been in the most wonderful, intimate, informal, but informative conversation with the three of you. It has been wonderful. And I think that the telephone, in fact, enhanced it because it was just like being at your house, Claudia. It has just been wonderful. I'm definitely putting on an event next year, which is going to be called Couscous or Gefilter Fish, for sure, in the food season. And I've just got this kind of tantalizing question about what was it that uh, the Chinese ate, Chinese Jewish yeah. communities ate in the 11th century. I mean, that is going to haunt me. And I think everyone who yeah, listens to it has been- You and I can invent that. Well, it, it's just been absolutely tantalizing and delicious listening to you, but to all, thank you. Um, if wonderful thank audience, so thank you for your beautiful questions. So sorry we couldn't answer them all. If you have enjoyed this evening's event, please come back and join us for other food season events which are taking place between now and the end of October. This weekend, in fact, on Saturday, we have an amazing double bill at two events, one called Beyond the Bank, which is looking at some really inspiring initiatives which are taking uh, sort of food solutions out to communities beyond food banks, really inspiring work. And another event on food futures with D Woods, Tim Lang and Dan Saladino, which will be very interesting on the future of food. We would absolutely love to see you again. Thank you again to our sponsors, KitchenAid. But most of all, thank you so much to Lucy, Claudia and Simon for just an, an evening I don't think any of us will ever forget. Thank you so much. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank it you. Was a pleasure. Thank, thank you. you, Lucy. <laughs> thank you, Polly. Good night, everybody. Thank you.